All right, this morning, um, I'm going to touch on a subject that we, when we had a camp meeting, the online camp, camp meeting, uh, we discussed the subject of um, whether or not God, God kills. We had a little panel where we discussed it, but I wasn't, I wasn't so happy with the way we, we dealt with it at the time. And I, I thought I wanted to go back to it. And the reason being that there are some very if sincere Christians who hold to this belief and there is some kind of biblical basis for the idea but of course i don't believe it sometimes i say things and it sounds like maybe i'm leading in that direction i know there are some people who have asked me the question do you believe that god does not kill and i've, I've had to explain myself because i believe in the love of god i believe in the in the I believe that God does not do anything vindictively or out of out of the way we understand anger or vengeance or revenge. I don't believe it because I don't think I think these are characteristics of somebody who does not understand why people do things or of somebody who loses control of himself. And I don't think these apply to God. But I know the Bible uses those kind of terminologies. So I thought I would look at look at the issue. There are some some good friends I have who hold to this belief, and they believe that it is vitally important. They believe it is the the final message to be given to the world. This message of what they and it's not the character of God that I have any issue with because we all believe that the 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 truth about God's character is the greatest message in the universe. It's the most important message of all. The truth about God's character. It's the final message to be given to the to the planet, and it's the most important one. But the, the the thing is, it's how they understand the character of God. That is the issue. It's not the the the, the subject is correct, but the way they understand it is 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 the issue. Um, one brother who is a part of the One God movement. He agrees with with the, the way we understand things in, in several respects. But he, he, he cannot work with us because he believes that God does not destroy, God does not kill. There's a whole ministry in Barbados that is dedicated to promoting this all over the world. And I also have a few young friends who, um, we're, not, we're not really close, but they are young friends that I've encountered recent, uh, over the past couple of years who, you know, we, 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 we got along pretty well, but then they are now going in this direction. And when you begin to highlight something as vitally important and you don't agree with somebody else or somebody else doesn't agree, what happens is that you begin to move in different directions. So with all of this, I thought it might be helpful if we look at the topic again this morning and just look at, just remind ourselves of some of the strong biblical reasons times personally takes the lives of, of, of individuals. I don't know what is the understanding of everyone who is in this group. I don't know. There might be people here who also hold to this belief. And so I, I don't want to be harsh or, or, or crude in what I'm saying. But I still want to look at what the Bible says as, as clearly as we can. Okay. So after that long preamble, I'm going to open up my Bible and we're going to, as usual, focus on the Bible. So, as I said, we, we, it really centers on the question of God's character. Now, the Bible says in, in 1 John 4 and verse 8, a, a very well-known, everybody knows this, right? He that loveth not knoweth not God, for God is love it's interesting that the bible does not say that god has love or god is loving you know as though love is 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 an aspect of god but it says that god is love which suggests that love love is all all that god consists of is love the embodiment of god the fullness of god the whole meaning of what god is is that god is love this is something the Bible teaches. Of course, 
one of the problems that we have is where people say God is love, but he's going to roast people in an eternal fire forever and ever and ever. This is one teaching of the majority of the Christian world. They, they say God is love, but they present God in a way that your understanding of love cannot agree. You can't see this as love. But what they say is that man's understanding is not God's understanding. The way we see things is not how God sees things. They say, even though God will roast people forever and ever, the, God, this is still an act of love. What, what, what these doctrines ask you to do is to reject your understanding of the meaning of words. They say, it's, it's kind of like the Trinity, okay? The Trinity says, says, God is three, but God is one. They say God is one being, but he's made up of three persons. And when you say, this does not make reasonable or logical sense. Because you understand the word one to mean single. And you understand the word three to mean multiple. And then they say three is one. What they're asking you to do, to do is revise your vocabulary to change the meaning of, of the words and to make the words mean something that is meaningless. So how do they explain it? They explain it by saying it is a mystery. And the word mystery means something that you can't understand, something that is beyond understandings. And that's, that is supposed to explain what is unexplainable. Well, it's, it's similar to this, this, this concept that people have of God. They say God is love. But, but God's love, okay, Pastor Laptop, let me set it up for you. But God's love is of such a nature that he can behave in an unloving way. And it is still love because God is a mystery. God's ways are mysterious and you can't understand God's ways. So when God acts in an, in an unloving way, it is still love. Because God's idea of love is different from your idea of love. This is the kind of reasoning that, you know, a lot, many Christians, many Christian teachings want you to accept. But I, 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 I have fundamental problems with that kind of thinking. And the reason is, how can you understand anything in religion? How can you understand anything in life? How can you relate to anything in life? It's based on the understanding you have in your head, right? If you tell me, if you tell me, say, praise God. And in my heart, I am saying, curse God. Does it make a difference? Does it make a difference if your heart says, curse God, and your mouth says, praise God? All it does is make you into a hypocrite. If your mouth says, God is love, but your understanding says, God is not love then all you are doing is you are, you, are, you are being a hypocrite. You are expressing what you don't believe or what you can't understand or accept. So in this way, it's very important that we have the right kind of ideas when we use words. The Bible is written in words. And yes, there are many times in the Bible when you have to, you have to look at the words and then the Bible explains what the words mean. And that's different because you have a difference sometimes in the way one person uses words and you also have the Bible written in a kind of in a kind of riddle form. But the Bible explains itself. So if it uses words in a certain way, then there are other places that explain the meaning of those words. But we can't see a clear biblical teaching. And then we come to the conclusion that, you know, it, 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 we are to take the opposite of what the Bible says. Because it's just a mystery. God says, accept it because it's a mystery, even though the word of God says something different. So anyway. But all of this, this preamble, we are looking at this subject of whether or not God kills. And it, they say, the Bible emphasizes that God is love. And, and now they go to the other extreme, the people who say God does not kill, because they say, since God is love, God cannot hurt somebody. Because true love will never hurt the object of its love. This is the philosophy behind it. True love cannot hurt its object. If you love something, you cannot hurt it. Now, right away, I see in this kind of thinking that there is a 
a faulty understanding. What it, the, the, the question is not whether or not God is love. That's not the question. The real question is, what is the nature of true love? What is the nature of love? That is the question. Is it possible for you to love somebody and cause hurt to that person? Is it possible for you to love somebody and cause hurt to that person? Well, if, 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 if I'm sorry, it's here. If this is not possible, I will have to say that my parents didn't love me. And I know that to be a lie. My parents, my parents caused hurt to me when I was a boy. My mother spanked me. My father, my father spanked me once or twice too, not as often as my mother, but he did. Because I, I, I needed a spanking from time to time because I was, I was a very stubborn and, and self-willed child. And, and sometimes even as a boy, when my father spoke to me, I would sit and listen because my father, he, he beat, he spanked me as a last resort. He never wanted to do it. He would talk and talk and talk. And sometimes I would say, just beat me and be done because I, I could not take the long talking and the lecturing. And um, he would talk because he would try to, 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 to make, us, make us understand the reason why we should not do certain things. And I would listen, I would listen. And I would leave and go and do the same thing immediately. I, 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 I would just listen so I could get the lecture over and then go and do my own thing again. And so sometimes he had to make me understand that if you, if you continue doing this, I have to stop you some way. So he would give me a spanking. And he loved me. I myself had to, I know that in the world today, it's not, it's not popular in the developed countries. It's not popular to spank your children. But I spank my children. And um, I love them. They know that I love them. But sometimes you cause pain because you want the person to become a better person. You have to protect the person. And sometimes you have to stop the person and you have to do it in a hard way because it's the only way. And if you tell me that love cannot hurt what it, it loves, I would say that your understanding of love is a perverted understanding because everything we see in life teaches us that true love sometimes has to hurt its object. I've seen an, an otter teaching the baby to swim. And it's an object lesson. I tell you, he grabs the baby. The baby doesn't want to go in the water. He doesn't know what water is. The, the mother grabs him and then he ducks him under. And then she ducks him under, ducks him under. And the little puppy is struggling, struggling. And it looks so cruel. It's survival. He has to learn to survive. And so the mother does it over and over. I've seen, um, you know, animals taking their young ones out. And if they get out of line, they swat them, knock them over or bite them. Because they know that their life is going to depend on how much they follow the rules. So they have to hurt them to make them understand. Nature teaches you this. Life teaches you, teaches you this, that in a place where sin exists, sometimes you have to hurt something in order to produce a, great, a better good. So the idea that love cannot hurt its object is neither reasonable, nor logical, nor scriptural. But this concept that God does, that because God loves, he cannot hurt. So I want I want to 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 address that a little bit more. Um, Sister Diana, I saw your mic. Come on. Were you going to say something? I I just wanted to interject here. That's what that what you just said is what ab abusers say to those that they abuse. That it's because they love them that they're beating them up. I mean, that's that's a concept of those who are abused say that person says to them, I love you, that's why I'm beating you up. Yes, I, I, I understand. And I, I would respond to that by saying, this is the way Satan perverts the truth. He perverts the truth, he takes what is true. I mean, is it true that people are being abused and mistreated? Absolutely. Is it true that people take a good thing and they misuse it? Absolutely. But then humanity is in the, in the in the practice they have a, they have the nature of going to extremes that's the way the human race that's how satan drives humanity into disorder because it, it pushes human beings into extremes you either become so cruel that there is rejection of the principle or you become so soft and impotent that you have what exists so much in so many places where children are unruly and without restraint 
And you know, I saw, I have a, there's a little video I have of a little boy. What is interesting is that this, this boy's mother is a Jamaican mother, but she's living in England. I, I don't know, sometime maybe I, 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 I'll post that video so you can see. And he, he, he's, cur he's being rude to the people on the bus. What are you looking at me for? Mind your own business. And the mother says, behave yourself, stop that. And then he says to his mother, if you talk to me like that, I'll punch you in your face. She says, boy, who are you talking to? And, you know, obviously he's accustomed to this kind of thing, right? He says, boy, who are you talking to? Um, he says, you are so ugly. And and she she says, you wait until you get home and you are going, you are going to, and she says, if you touch me, I'll call the police. It is unbelievable. It is unbelievable. And you, you know that this, this little boy is going to become some kind of hooligan when you just to hear him talk and to see. And you know it's true. His mother can't touch him. He'll call the police. Okay. So we we have a similar situation. Anyway, I don't want to get caught caught off track. So what I'm saying is the fact that something is misused and abused, you can look at almost any area of life and you see that it is true. It happens. But it doesn't mean the principle is wrong. It just means that in a sinful world, people take what is good and they pervert it. And people in, in, in reaction, they, they, they go the other direction and they create a, a, a different evil that is just as, as bad or maybe even worse than the other evil. So anyway, so what, what, what these people, these brethren will typically say is that Jesus is the perfect example of what God is. And this is true. The Bible says clearly that no man has seen God at any time. The only begotten son, which is in the bosom of the father, he has revealed him. He has declared him. In Hebrews 1 verses 1 and 2, it says that in the past, God spoke unto the fathers by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken unto us by his son. And what this is saying is that you look at the Old Testament and you see, you see the things that God did there. But, but that is not a true representation of God. God's perfect representation of himself came through Jesus. If you want to know what is really in the heart of God, then look at Jesus. And there's another verse that says something similar in 1 Corinthians 4, verses, verse 6. It says, I'm sorry, it's 2 Corinthians. It's not 1 Corinthians. It's 2 Corinthians 4. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 6. It says, um, God who commanded the light to shine out of darkness has shined in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. You see God when you look at Jesus. And the argument these brethren present, and it's a good argument, the argument is that Jesus never hurt anybody. You look at Jesus and he never hurt anybody. When his enemies attacked him, he turned the other side. When James and John wanted to call down fire on the Samaritans, Jesus says, you don't know what kind of spirit you have. And the point they make is that the spirit of God is not a spirit that wants to destroy those who oppose God. And so they say, you see clearly, this is the way God is. This is the spirit of God. And so it cannot be that God goes contrary to his own spirit. It's in his spirit. It's what he is. Therefore, how can he act out of, out of character to what he is? So this is their argument. The problem is that there are some very clear biblical examples that you can't get around. And I'm going to come to those examples. But this is a problem. You cannot build, you cannot build a doctrine based on the Bible that to what the Bible says. Now I know that sometimes it seems like you are rejecting the Bible when what you are doing, you are, you are balancing one text with another text. For example, where, where the Bible says that, you know, the sinners, they are going to be tormented with fire and brimstone forever and ever. There are other verses in the Bible that you use to balance that verse and to try to understand it in a way that is compatible with love. For example, in Malachi chapter 4, it says that in the day when God destroys sinners, they shall be ashes under your feet. The verse says it will, it will leave them neither root nor branch. So you have verses in the Bible 
that you can use to explain what the other verses mean so that you still preserve that idea that God is fair and God is just and God is not cruel and vindictive and he's not going to tor torment people forever. So even though something is in the Bible that seems to say this, you use, you use the same Bible to explain in a way that satisfies this need for God to be fair and just. So I'm not saying there, there are no verses that are revealed in Jesus Christ. They are there. And it is one of the most beautiful truths in the Bible. You see the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. However, does this mean that all the verses that say that God takes life, does it mean that those verses are, are, are lies? Can you explain all of them in such a way that you don't do harm to the scriptures? That is the question. So some of these brethren, or most of them, maybe all of them, what they will say, they will say, yes, we agree that God kills. We agree that God kills, but how? That is their typical answer. God does destroy, but how? And what they try to say is that, yes, God destroys in the sense that he gives Satan the freedom to destroy. They say God himself does not do it, but he allows Satan to do it. And because he allows Satan to do it, you can say that God does it because he's sovereign. He, he can stop it. He can control everything. But because he doesn't stop it, then he says, then, then the Bible says God did it. And it is true that there are places in the Bible. We're going to look at a couple of them. There are places in the Bible that, that, that reveal God operating in this way. He allows Satan to do something, and then God says, I did it. It's in the Bible. So they are right. But the question is, is this true for every single case? Can you say that every time the Bible says God killed somebody, God destroyed somebody, can you say that it was just because God allowed Satan to do it? We're going to look at, at incidents that show, no, this is not so. You cannot say this in every case. So what we, what we have is the danger. We have the danger that because, because people want to believe something, they take some of the evidence. They take some of the evidence and they formulate a doctrine which requires them to reject the rest of the evidence. You can't have a balance. On, there, there, uh, some time ago, right here on this, on this fellowship, I shared uh, some thoughts. And, and what, what I try to point out is that the greatest tool, the greatest key to understanding the Bible is first of all, to understand the character of God, the nature of God. And I believe this. If you understand the character of somebody, you know, like, like I, I mean, let me go to a popular illustration that I like to use. If somebody tells me that my wife has been un unfaithful to me, I'm not saying it's impossible because when you're dealing with human nature, but I will, I will tell you that having known her, I, I've been married for 40, 42 years now. And I knew her for about three years, about five years before we got married. And in those nearly 50 years, what I've come to know of her makes me so confident in, the, in her character, not only her character, but the way she feels about me. I could be pretty certain if somebody tells me this. I would say that this person misunderstood what he saw or he misunderstood what he heard. Now, this is, this is dealing with a human being. What, what more when you are dealing with God? If you know God and you understand the character of God, somebody comes and tells you that God will do a certain thing or God did a certain thing and you say, I don't believe you. I don't believe you. And they come and they show you a verse in the Bible that says, look and see, it says God did this. And I say, you don't understand the verse. Because you don't know God. So what I'm saying is that the greatest key for understanding the Bible is, first of all, knowing the character of God, understanding the kind of person God is. And the Bible gives you, the Bible gives you reason to stand upon this, upon this foundation. But secondly, 
to, to, to have great confidence in, in, in a certain doctrine, you need to become familiar with the scriptures so that you, you have a good idea what the Bible says here and what the Bible says there so that you can form a balanced opinion. So what I'm saying about this, this issue that God, whether or not God kills, people take one side of the scripture and they come to an unbalanced position. When you take all of the scripture into consideration, we can harmonize the truth. God is love. And yet God's love is of such a nature that sometimes it does have to take a life. That is what we see when we look at the Bible. Now, they say, for want of a better term, I'm just saying they, okay? I don't want to call people's names or something, but they say that, yes, God kills, but how? God allows Satan to do the destruction and God takes the credit. But I'm going to say this is not the true picture. The true picture is God kills, but why? Why? God kills, but why? One time, I killed a dog. I killed a dog. With my own hands, I killed a dog. I used a hoe and I hit the dog in the head and killed the dog. And if, if you saw this, you might think that I am a, I am an extremely cruel person. But if you understand the circumstances, you would, David killed, but why? Jamaica is not like in the United States where, you know, you have dog doctors and dog hospitals and so on. If you live in certain areas and your dog gets really sick, you leave him to die or he's going to die. My neighbor had a dog and this dog, for some reason got sick it was paralyzed from the from the waist down it couldn't move and you know nobody knows why but the dog was there lying in the yard and one night i woke up and um i heard the dog crying all night when i went to look in the morning the dog was covered with with maggots it, it had been the, the, the screwworm fly had laid eggs all over this dog and the entire body was covered with maggots i i i, I used i tried to scrape off these these maggots. It was a poor job, but the dog was suffering. It was dying, and it was going to stay there until it, it died a terrible death. I went to my neighbor and I asked, "Would you like me to kill the dog for you?" Because he 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 didn't want he he was squeamish. Okay, I said, okay, uh, "Would you like me to kill the dog for you?" Because I couldn't stand the dog of this. I couldn't stand the thought of this dog just lying there day after day until it just died this terrible death and my neighbor was happy to say yes go ahead so i went and i dug a hole and i i, I dragged the dog down to the hole and I, I got the hoe because it's the only tool i had that that, that 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 and when i raised the hoe to hit the dog the dog looked at me and when when she looked at me with those trusting i tell you to this day i remember the, the eyes of the dog I, I looked at her eyes and i couldn't i could not hit her and so i got a piece of cloth and i covered her eyes and then i came back and I, I i hit her one time right at the base of her skull and her body just shivered a little bit and she died and i felt a feeling i think it, it's probably the kind of feeling cain must have felt when he killed abel I, I felt this feeling of this terrible feeling just wash over me but i look back on it until today and i know i did the right thing because I put that dog out of its suffering and it was hard for me to do it. But I did it because I cared for the dog, not because I hated the dog, not because I was taking vengeance, revenge or anything like that. I cared for this dog. And because I cared for this dog, I had to take the dog's life. Which is why I asked the question. And I mean, it, it, for, for people who live in countries like, um, you know, the developed countries where you have all these facilities for taking care of animals and so forth. It might seem strange, but I will tell you that in, in third world countries, it is not like this. There, there are not those kinds of provisions to take care of your pets, right? A dog, a dog is just a little creature that roams about on the streets and, and rummages in people's garbage cans and you, people throw stones at them. And there is just something that exists around the landscape. Anyway, the point I'm making is that this is a question. It's not, does God kill? Because the, 
in order to ask this question, you have to be prepared to reject what the Bible says. So that cannot be a question. Does God kill? What are you going to do with the Bible? The question is, God kills. But why? Why does a God of love find it necessary to take the life of somebody that he loves? Why does God find that necessary? And like I said, this, this, this experience I had with this dog teaches me or emphasizes for me that love does not necessarily mean inactivity. It doesn't mean that you do nothing. It doesn't mean that you, you, you are impotent to put a stop to suffering. Now, the, 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 the real problem is that our brethren are looking at only one thing, one thing. It's how you view the reason why people do something. Now, if, if you look at the world today, if you look at human, the human system, why do we hurt people and why do we cause pain to people? Usually it's because we are seeking A, revenge, B, another name for that is retribution, same thing, or, 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 or two, what we call justice. What is justice? You ask yourself that fundamental question. What is justice? What is vengeance? The Bible says God does both things. He takes vengeance and he is a God of justice. But ask yourself, what does that word mean? What do these words mean? Basically, vengeance is, a, 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 is an attitude that says, because you hurt me, I will hurt you in return. Because you hurt me, I am grieved, I am upset. And because you hurt me, I am going to hurt you in return. In hurting you, I'm going to satisfy my feelings. This is vengeance. I want to repeat that because I want, I want us to get that straight because the Bible uses the word vengeance. God says, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. But the point is, when you think of what vengeance really means, do you worship a God who is that kind of way? I understand vengeance among people. I understand when a person says, I don't like it, but I understand when somebody says, you hurt me and you're going to get it back. When somebody says this, I understand. But I, I, I pity the person who behaves like this because I know this person is suffering and, and, and causing, is breeding bad vibes in himself. But it's human. The human way is retribution and vengeance. You hurt me. You robbed my brother. You broke into my house. You hit me in my face. I will never be happy until you suffer proportionately. And when you suffer, I will feel better. That's vengeance. And if you think that God is like this, then of course you should behave like this. But can this be the way God behaves when God says, love your enemies? Love your enemies. Bless, and he, he, he explains, bless those who curse you. Pray for those who despitefully use you. Can God tell you to do this when he himself does something different? Then God would be a hypocrite. You cannot be different from the God that you worship. It doesn't make sense. We worship him because we think he's worthy, because we admire him. If he is one thing and asking us to be something else, that's an impossible situation. So, although the Bible speaks of vengeance, that is one of the, 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 the words that I would have to interpret when I'm talking about God. I would have to say God is using human terminology, but when it comes to God, I have to understand that a different way. It's like when God says, Jacob I love, but Esau have I hated. What is hate? Hate is a feeling of revulsion, of scorn, a feeling where you totally, utterly repudiate and reject a person based on your feelings. Hate has to do with feelings. But when God uses the word, if you look at the Bible, when God uses the word and talks about hating Esau, he's not talking about his feelings. He's talking about his actions. The way God acted towards Esau, you would say that God hated Esau. His actions towards Esau were actions that did not show the kind of favor that he had towards Jacob. But does it mean that in his heart, God had the feelings that you have when you say, I hate? No, it doesn't mean that. 
So what I'm saying is that there are certain ideas we associate with words. We need to properly understand when we come to the Bible, how does the Bible use those words with respect to God? Anyway, so when people talk about does God kill, usually they are thinking of killing as a punishment. They are thinking of killing as, a, as revenge, as vengeance. Does God kill because of vengeance? Does God say, you fail to keep the Sabbath, I'm going to make you suffer for it. You worship idols, I'm going to make you suffer for it. I am going to, 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 to do this to you because you didn't keep the Sabbath. This is what these brethren are objecting to. And in this, from this perspective, I agree with them. If you think God, in the commonly understood sense of the word, then I think you don't understand God's character. It is true that those who reject God's will, whether it's a Sabbath or, or idol worship, those people will die. But is it because God is taking vengeance or is it because of the consequences? Or is it because such people have put themselves in a place where the only thing that God can do to end their suffering is to put them to death? What is done is the reason why it is done. Sometimes, sometimes God will put somebody to death in order to end the suffering of the person. When we come to the end of the thousand years, when the judgment is over and when sin has completely worked out its course and God will finally, the Bible says that fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. You ask yourself, if God does not kill, if God does not destroy, what should God do? God would say, I'm going to leave these wicked to themselves. I'm going to build a little world and put them there and leave them forever. I won't, I won't hurt them because I can't hurt. I can't kill. And so God leaves people without his spirit, without his protection, and he leaves a world of billions of people to do what? To suffer and suffer and suffer until, of course, what will happen is that they will wipe each other out. They will destroy each other. Murder and rape and looting and all of that will continue. They will suffer like a dog eaten by maggots until eventually they wipe themselves out. That's all that would happen. Far, far more merciful for a God of love to put an end to their lives and an end to suffering. That is what a strong person does. It is a weak person who says, I am too finicky. I can't stand the sight of blood. I'm too finicky. I can't hurt somebody. This appears to be beautiful to some people. In my perspective, from the Bible's perspective, it's a sign of weakness. If, if something needs to be done, if there's no other way and you can't do it, it's weakness. It's not strength. Love does what has to be done even though it causes me pain. It's like God sent his son to do what? To die. God sent his son to suffer and to die. God gave up his son to become one of us forever. Why? Because he was weak? No, because he was strong. Because God knew when he gave, us his, when he gave his son, he knew the pain he would feel. He knew the pain his son would feel. He knew that it, but he did it because he is strong, because love is strong. Love does what has to be done. So it's not vengeance. One of the motives to put an end to the wicked is because of ending the suffering of other people. Another reason is to protect people. You know, if, if, if there is a, many times, uh, for example, when, when God destroyed Sodom, when God destroyed the world in the time of the flood, why did God do that? It was in order to protect the rest of humanity the remnant of humanity. It was, order to, it was in order to safeguard while God eliminated what had become completely wicked, completely without hope. God took, took it out of the way in order to preserve the remnant of the human race. So there, there, there are many different reasons why one could legitimately take the life of somebody else. Now I'm going to look at some, some, some verses which, which, which illustrate that sometimes God allows Satan to do something and God claims it as though he did it. 
there's a very um, popular one in the Bible. Second Samuel 24 and verse one. Look at what it says. And again, the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel. And he moved David against them to say, go number Israel and Judah. Look what it says. It says, God moved David to tell him to number Israel. Now, look at what it says in 1 Chronicles 21 and verse 1. It's the same story. It's just being told in a different book. It says, then Satan stood up against Israel and moved David to number Israel. Same story, same Bible, but in the book of Chronicles, it says Satan moved David to number Israel. In 2 Samuel 24, it says, he, the Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh, he moved David to tell him to go and number Israel. So if, if we are not the kinds of people who understand the principle behind what I'm trying to say, we can say the Bible contradicts itself. Those who like to criticize the Bible, the Muslims, other people, they will say the Bible contradicts itself because here it says God moved David and then in, in Chronicles it says Satan moved David. So it's clearly, in terms of the words, it's a clear contradiction. But it just illustrates the point that I am making. When God allows something to happen, many times the Bible says God did it. So God, God permitted Satan to tempt David and therefore in Samuel it says God moved David because he allowed it. All right, so this is true in the Bible many times. Here's another example. In Job 2, verses 9, verses 9 and 10. This is after Satan began to afflict Job. And it says, Then said his wife unto him, Dost thou still retain thine integrity? Curse God and die. But he said unto her, Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive evil? In all this did not Job sin with his lips. Notice that Job, Job believes that he's receiving evil from the hand of God. It's the hand of God that is producing this evil in his life. Job is giving God the credit for what is happening to him. Job's wife is giving God the credit. Job's wife says, curse God and die. Now we read the rest of the story and we know what happened. It is Satan who is doing this. It says Satan leaves the presence of God and he goes and he afflicts Job. But at the same time, how was Satan able to do this? He got permission from God. So because God could have stopped it, but God, God did not stop it. God allowed it. God takes the blame. Job's wife blames God. Job blames God. And um, if somebody was writing the story in some, some other place, they might have said, God afflicted Job. God afflicted Job. Because in a sense, it is true. If you can stop it and you don't stop it, then you are the one who is responsible. So this is a biblical principle. And from this perspective, I will say, the people who say, God destroyed, but how? They are partially right. Because sometimes it happens that God does allow something and then he, he, he takes the blame. But now I'm going to look at some, some verses. I'm going to look at some passages where it is absolutely impossible for you to interpret it in this way. And please understand what I'm doing, okay? I'm trying to give us a balanced perspective. I want us to see that these brethren, they have, they have, they have, uh, they mean well, they have a good approach because what they are trying to do is to preserve the reputation of God. And I appreciate this, but, but you cannot, uh, uh, you cannot, Preserve God's reputation by building on a falsehood. Because while you are building one thing, you are destroying something else. Because what they're actually doing, they are destroying your dependence on the scriptures. Because they say they are trying to preserve the reputation of the God of the scriptures, the God of the Bible. One thing should not overthrow the other. Now, I'm going to show you some verses. And I, I, I have selected these incidents carefully because there are some passages that are not so clear. For example, you know, there are places where it says that God kills somebody. 
and you could question it. Maybe, maybe it was nature. Maybe it was an act of nature. Like one brother told me that um, the the flood, the flood happened because God withdrew His 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 His, his protection, and then the forces of nature came in, and and the 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 the, the water fell from the sky. And the water came up out of the ground and the earth started to break up because all God did was withdraw from the earth. He didn't actually produce that water or he didn't actually send that water. It happened because God withdrew his presence. But I'm, I'm going to show you some, some cases where it is impossible. If you believe what the Bible is saying, it's impossible for you to explain it any other way other than that God himself actually did this action. All right, so the first place I want us to look at is Sodom. So when you go to, to Genesis chapter 18, here's what God says in, in verse 26. He's talking to Abraham. Jesus talking to Abraham. And the Lord said, if I find in Sodom 50 righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their six. Now, what I, what I want to point out here is that the destruction of Sodom was at God's discretion. Notice what he says. If I find 50, I will spare the place, meaning that it was still in his mind that I have the option to spare the city or to destroy it. It was not something like, like there was going to be a volcano or something was on the way and it was unstoppable. God says, I'm going to look and if I find 50 righteous, I'm going to spare the city. And he goes on right down until he goes down to 10. If I find 10 righteous, for adventure 10 shall be found there. And he said, I will not destroy it for 10 sake. So there's no question that what happened was that it was within the discretion of the Lord as to who, as to whether or not Sodom would be destroyed. When it was destroyed, it was because he decided it shall be destroyed. In chapter 19, here's what we see in verse one. There came two angels to Sodom at evening and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. Genesis 19 and verse 22. Look at what the angels do. Look at the, what it says. The angel says to Lot, haste thee and escape thither. Run to Zoar. Not do anything till thou become thither. Cannot do anything like what? Look at what the angel says to Lot. Let me see. Um, where is it? Look what he says in verses 12 and 13. And the, meds, the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides, son-in-law, thy sons, thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city? Bring them out of this place. Now look what he says. For we will destroy this place. Are these God's angels or Satan's angels? We will destroy this place. That's what he's, the angels say to Lot. And furthermore, in verse 22, here's what they say. Hurry up and escape, for I cannot do anything till you, till you become thither. What is the angel saying? I can't destroy Sodom. I can't do anything until you leave. In other words, the angel has been sent to destroy Sodom, and he's saying, I can't do the job until you are gone. What job is he going to do and how is he going to do this job? It's the angel who destroys Sodom according to what he's telling Lot. And these are not Satan's angels. They came down with Jesus to Abraham. Jesus remained with Abraham and the two angels went on. They went to Sodom. They met Lot. Lot took them into his, the house. And then in the morning they said, look, get out of here. We are, we are here to destroy the place. Lot says, please, please don't send me to the mountain. Send me to this little city over here. Isn't it a little one? So they allow him to go and they say, look here, hurry up and go. Because I cannot do anything till you, till you, till you arrive in Zohar. So the angel is waiting. He's not exercising that power. He's waiting until Lot reaches Zohar. Then he destroys Zohar. If you believe that this is Satan who destroyed Sodom, you are saying that God and Satan are working in partnership. The angel says to Satan, hold on a little, hold on a little, wait. Let Lot get out first. No, no, not yet. Wait until he reaches Zohar. Wait, hold on. Finally, Lot is in Zohar and the angel said to Satan, okay, Satan, you can go ahead and do it now. And Satan cooperates. It's kind of really ridiculous to believe that God and Satan work together in this kind of way, like they're partners. Absolutely not. Satan has no 
intention of cooperating with God in anything at all. Here's another story. 2 Kings 1 verses 9 and 10. Look at this one. This is a hard one. But I don't know how you can explain this any other way other than to say that this story is not true. Elijah is sitting on a mountain. And the king of Israel, who is an enemy of God, he sends for Elijah. And I believe he's very disrespectful because Elijah is God's representative. But he sent unto him a captain of 50 with his 50. And he went up to him and behold, he sat on the top of a hill. And he spake unto him, man of God, the king has said, come down. I don't know how he said it or what was going on. But it says, Elijah answered and said to the captain of 50, if I be a man of God, then let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy 50. And there came down fire from heaven and consumed him and his 50. 50 men dead in an instant. Fire comes down from heaven. And if you think that it was a, it was a, it was a, a, a an amazing coincidence. Again, also, he sent unto him another captain of 50 with his 50. And he answered and said unto him, O man of God, thus hath said the king, come down quickly. And Elijah answered and said unto them, if I be a man of God, let fire come down from heaven and consume thee and thy 50. And the fire of God came down from heaven and consumed him and his 50. Now, again, where did this fire come from? If God, if God does not destroy, if God does not kill, where did this fire come from? If you say it is Satan, I will ask you, isn't it remarkable how Elijah says, if I am a man of God, let fire come. Fire comes. So what does that mean? If this fire is from Satan, what it means is that Elijah is a man of Satan. But Elijah says, if I am a man of God and the fire does come down from heaven, and it happens twice to make you know it's not coincidence. The third captain came and he asked Elijah to spare his life and no fire came. Now, of course, what is, what is, is strange is that James and John wanted to, to do the same thing in the time of Jesus. They wanted to call on fire from heaven and destroy the city of Samaria. And Jesus said, you don't know what kind of spirit you have. And so the, the brethren who say that God does not kill, they will look at this and they will say, you see, this is not the spirit of God. The spirit of God does not destroy his enemies. And Jesus showed, showed us that. Jesus proved that to us. So the question is, whose spirit was this working with Elijah? You have to say that Elijah was a prophet of the devil. And of course, that is rubbish. But at the same time, why the question is not whether or not god did this the question is why did god do this that is your question as a bible student that is your question as a christian who believes in the bible your question is not did god do this because that question cannot be answered that question doesn't make any sense you have to destroy the bible to find your answer to that question the question you want the, the proper question is why does a god of love do this and then you begin to understand the difference between the old covenant and the new covenant you begin to understand that the old covenant is a parable that god is trying to teach certain lessons here that is a part of the answer but it cannot be the correct answer to say that the bible says something so clearly and you declare that it is a lie to suit your doctrine that does not make sense. The examples, and, and probably I have to get back to the, the, the subject some other time because I'm just about halfway through. But I, I want to look at a couple of other, uh, other examples. Pharaoh's army, the destruction of Pharaoh's army. In, in, in Exodus 14, look at verses 15 and 16. It says, And the Lord said unto Moses, Wherefore criest thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. Now, before that, look at what God says. The Egyptians whom you, shall, you have seen today, you shall see them again no more forever. The Lord shall fight for you and you shall hold your peace. Who fought for Israel that day? Was it the Lord? Was it Yahweh or was it Satan? The Lord shall fight for you. You shall see these Egyptians no more forever. And then he says to God, he says to Moses, 
Lift up thy rod and stretch out thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry land. See. So Moses does. He stretches out his rod, the sea parts, and he goes through. The seas obey the rod of Moses. So God saves the Israelites and they go through the Red Sea. God parts the Red Sea. God does it. There's no question. It is not Satan who is saving these people. It is God. You go down to verse 26 and look at what happens. And the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out thine hand over the sea that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon the chariots and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared. And the Egyptians fled against it and the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. Who closed up the Red Sea? Now, if you say, you know, like some of these brethren say, okay, God opened the Red Sea. And then when Israel was, was, was out of the Red Sea, God let go the, the, the Red Sea and it came upon the Egyptians. God did not intend to kill the Egyptians. He only released the water because the Israelites were no longer there and the Egyptians happened to die. Strange reasoning. But if you look at what the Bible says, Look at what God says. The Lord said to Moses, stretch out thine hand over the sea again, that the waters may come upon the Egyptians. In other words, did the No. The waters were parted by the rod of Moses. And the waters could not come together again until the rod was stretched out. So it was God's deliberate plan. He deliberately said to Moses, stretch out your rod so that the water may come again upon the Egyptians. It was God's plan and design because he had told Moses from the beginning, these Egyptians that you see today, you will not see them again. So there's no question that it was God himself. Whoever parted the Red Sea is the same person who destroyed Pharaoh's army. This is what the Bible says. This is biblical evidence. How do you reject all of this to suit your, 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 your philosophy, your doctrine? Typically, if you discuss this subject, what these brethren will say is, if, if you ask the question, I've, 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 dis I've had discussions and I've asked these brethren over and over, who destroyed Pharaoh's army? What they will do is they will refuse to answer the question. They will tell you God is love. They will tell you, look at Jesus and you will understand. But they will not answer these questions. You try to ask specific questions. Who, does, who, who sent the fire from heaven to destroy the 50? Who closed up the Red Sea? They will not answer the question directly. I see you, Brother Ian. They, they will not they answer the question answer directly. directly. And this, and is, this uh, is a major red major flag. Red flag. Because it, it shows you that if you have a theory, if you have a theory that cannot stand up to questioning, something is wrong with your theory. And you know, if you cannot answer the questions, you know that there's something wrong. You need to be honest and answer the questions. Let me take your, 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 your comment quick, Brother Ian, and then let me just finish because my time is up. I just wanted to say that uh, the, the argument that people put forward saying that God just removed his protection and things happen. Is not really when you compare that to what David did with Uriah's wife, um, Uriah and Joab in the army. He just tell the Joab to pull back the um, pull back when the, the battle is hot and leave him alone. It will be the same thing. But you clearly the Bible put the responsibility and on, on, on the blame on David for instructing him to do the same thing. David never really killed him. Absolutely, and, and um, you know that's a good that's a good point to make because if if you Hire a hitman to kill somebody. How can you say I never kill the person? What it means is that you are too weak or too afraid to pull the trigger, but you hire somebody to do it. And you think that in your head, you think you're not a killer when you hire somebody to kill somebody. The only reason you didn't do it was because you are too weak to do it or you're afraid of being personally caught, but your heart has the motive. So what's the difference? And, and what these, you would be saying is that God has the motive of doing it, but he can't do it himself. He has to find somebody. He has to allow his enemy to do it. Now, I don't know if, if, if our brethren look into these issues 
and look into the, these principles because it's very it's very obvious. You 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 have somebody in the hospital who is on life support. The person is being preserved because they are getting oxygen and whatever else. You go and you remove the life support. You take you turn off the oxygen or whatever it is, and the person dies. Did you kill the person? No, I didn't. It was lack of oxygen. Come on. I mean, what kind of argument is this? So it's the same kind of reasoning that we get from our brethren who take this position. I'll, I'll just mention uh, uh, the other couple of cases. I won't read them. But we have the story of Korah, Dathan, and Abraham. Moses David. says, God says, look here. If these men die, the death of an ordinary person, then I, I have not sent Moses. But if the earth does something strange, if something different happens today and the earth opens her mouth and swallows them, then you know that God has sent Moses. He says, move from around the tents of these men. Everybody moves. And what happens? The earth opens and swallows them. My, my, my. Satan is so cooperative. Satan opens the ground, swallows up Dathan, Korah, and Abiram to show the world that God sent Moses. And Brother David. Yes, it's Anita. Um, um, uh, <laughs> you could say mockingly also that um, was it Satan who stole those two men who, who took strange fire into the sanctuary? You know what I mean? That's another one. Yes, because that fire came straight out of the most holy place. Yes. That Satan should be in there in the very presence of God. I'm telling you, this is of God. We also have um, two, other, two other incidents where God did not directly remove life but he gave instruction one of them is when he told saul to go and wipe out the amalekites saul came back he preserved the king and he preserved some of the sheep and god says to samuel i i am sorry that i have made saul king because he has not kept the commandment of the lord and he didn't mean the ten commandments this commandment was the commandment to kill it was not the commandment that thou shalt not kill god told samuel God told Saul, go and wipe out the Amalekites. Saul was so loving and so merciful. He spared some of the, 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 the animals and he spared the king of Amalek. And God says, because you have done this, I have rejected you from being king. No question that it was Satan who gave this, whether Satan gave this instruction, it was God. What was important was obeying God, not to, not to burden yourself with the question, is it good to kill or not to kill? And the last one I will, will mention is the man who was picking up sticks on the Sabbath day. And why this is interesting is because it says in Numbers chapter 15 here in verse 33, they that found him gathering sticks brought him to Moses and Aaron and unto all the congregation, and they put him in war. They locked him up because it was not declared what should be done to him. Now, nobody knows what to do to him. And the Lord said unto Moses, the man shall be surely put to death. That is God's decision. That is God's sentence. That is not Moses' sentence. That's not the people's sentence. That's God's sentence. Again, how do you, how do you tell people to do what you are against, what is contrary to your nature? They never made the suggestion. It is God who made the suggestion. And if you say it was because God had to live by the law that he had made, God didn't have to make a law to put him to death. God could have said, give him 50 stripes, give him 50 lashes. It was God's decision that this particular sin should carry the death sentence. God's decision, not Moses, not Satan's. It was God's decision. Now, I know that some of these sentences are harsh and they're hard to understand. Yet there was a very good reason why a God of love should do something like this. And um, as I said, we're going to have a part two of this. I'm going to look at it next week. I'm going to go to part two next week because the rest of the story, I do not want to be left unsaid because I don't want to leave a bad reputation around the name of God because everything is based on love. Everything is, is based on mercy. But to understand it properly is what we want to do. But my time is up. So thank you all for being so patient and listening. Thank you for your participation. And um, I want to apologize for taking a little, little bit out of Brother Howard's time. Have a blessed day. We're going to with prayer.